uh, was to try to see if I could find some way myself to DIY a uh, way out of my suffering. I was in graduate school, walking down, I work on a PhD, walking down towards campus, and I had the epiphanous moment of stepping back and looking at what was going on up here. It turns out it was just blah, 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 which is why, you know, it was about nothing in particular. Worthless, had nothing to do with my doctoral thesis, nothing whatsoever. But for whatever reason, I was moved to believe. I had all these thoughts up there, and there was no belief that that was okay. I had suffered a lot by the time I was in my late 20s, and so I had a lot of narrative going on that was very painful, and there was no reason it should have been. I had good money to get through graduate school, good assistantship, wife, two kids, everything was fine, very healthy, but I had this problem. And so I thought, is there some way I can stop this? I had no reason to believe this was possible. I had not read anything that was possible, but I knew somehow I had to stop this thing. So I set about trying to find a way to stop this narrative. It turns out, as I got on this path, uh, I was going to do it DIY, one. I was going to do it empirically, scientifically, with no philosophy, no religion, absolutely naked. I was being trained as an empirical, empirical scientist. But the idea was, can I just run the experiments myself? Give me the lab notebook. I'll run the experiments, and I'll see if it works or not. And I'll say yes or no for the experiment. That's all I'm going to do. Sources have to be contemporary. We're trying to do this thing scientifically, empirically. Contemporary sources. I didn't want anything from 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago been passed down through God knows how many hands of people with vested interest in making it come out of some way. So the idea was it's got to be those parameters. Very scientific contemporary sources that I could validate, that I had videos of, people had, I talked to, could, had met them, I had met them myself. So it had to be absolutely a clean data set and clean sources. And so this idea of relying on religious traditions, philosophy, I was not a philosopher, I was an empiricist, so no philosophy. No religion, I came from a blaming, shaming religion. I've had enough of that, thank you very much. So I was trying to find some way out of this thing. And these are what I just talked about. The reason we had to do this thing. And I was focusing on this, these thoughts that I had, and could I reduce them? Empirical open source, secular teachings. And the hardest part of it was, it was going to have to function in the real world. I couldn't become completely dysfunctional. This had to be an operative system that I could live with. And the most important distinction was, in addition to these different, uh, different difficult caveats, was it had to be a state, not just an experience. I mean, a lot of non-duality people say, well, I had an experience 26 years ago. And I can still remember it, fantastically vivid, vivid I'm a non-dualist. I said, well, <laughs> not so much. Because we have a lot of research now on memories. I was in a false memory fMRI study. I mean, you may, you have, something's two years old, and you've called it up four, five, six, eight times. It's not, it's not correct anymore. Your memory is absolutely incorrect. So it had to be a lasting state. Mini-me is down here because it really came to be a process of trying to find a mini-me, a less me-involved operating system. This narrative thing that I found unpleasant wasn't unique to me. It was a great study in science that was done at UVA by some really good people, some of the best people in the field, and it was saying, okay, what if we can just take some UVA undergraduates and put 150 of them in a room one at a time and give them and say, okay, be by yourself for 15 minutes, no toys, no distractions, you can just be there with your, the pleasure of your thoughts. And how's that work for you? They said, oh. They, not surprisingly, 90% came back and said, no good, no good. Said, okay, well, maybe it's because we got them in a laboratory. So they sent them back home, go back home, go back to your pod. They go back to their pod, okay, even worse. First, 15% of them cheated, of course. But the ones that didn't cheat said, it's just as bad as it was in the lab. So maybe it's just these undergraduates. You know how undergraduates are. So they went on to, into Charlottesville, rounded up a bunch of people from a church, farmer's market, 
ran them through this thing, average age 42, much more affluent than some of the students, at least not, not their parents, perhaps. Uh, same result, same bad result. Okay, this is not okay. Take 50 of these people and ask them if they like electric shocks. And you find the ones that say, no, I do not like electric shocks. <laughs> okay, well, you're, you're in the pool. So you get in this thing, you're in the not like electric shocks pool, and we're going to give you a button in your hand, a control, that goes to an anklet that has a shocking collar on it. And you're going to go back in that room again. You can sit there 15 minutes again, and we'll just see how it goes for you. If you need to be diverted your attention some way to pull your attention back away from what you're doing going through, you just push this button. You get a strong electric shock to your ankle, and it will bring you out of your unhappiness. So as you might imagine from the picture, this didn't turn out well. Uh, Two-thirds of the guys, men, shocked themselves. Only one quarter of the women, so women really are smarter than men. <laughs> but, but, the guys shocked themselves an average of 1.5 times, and the girls 2.3 times. But this is an unpleasant state for many people, almost everybody. We have so many things we do to not have to face into this state. And this will be about trying to explore ways to do that. So I went about some practices, uh, classical Zen practices. And this fellow, Basui, 14th century Zen monk, uh, very famous in some sectors. And this fellow you know, probably all know, Nara Maharshi. He was really my main man through this thing. And these questions are very simple. And for me, as an empirical scientist, this one didn't work for me so much. Got philosophical. The ones I liked were this one, where am I, and who hears? And I went to my Zen masters, and they were all Rinzai Zen, which is the koan school. I said, hey, one guy was a big Mu person, if you know the Zen koans. I said, you know, I, I can't get into Mu. It may be a great thing for a Japanese mind, but it doesn't paradoxically engage me. Something like, where am I? That really gets, I can really try to solve that. I'm an empirical scientist. I should know where I am. So I talked to the Roshi. He said, sure, you can do that. So I set off to do that. It was actually in our sutra book anyway. So I went off to do that. My other Zen master, same thing. I asked her about it. He said, sure, perfect. Go ahead and do that thing. So I just did this. I just asked these questions over and over and over again, along with things like, I'm not this body. This belief that we have, we are this body. I just asked them a lot of times. And after a lot of sitting meditation, they stopped. You know, I had to do a lot of hours of this thing, a lot of yoga. I didn't have any guidance, really. The Zen people hadn't really worked this thing. I needed a coach. I didn't have a coach. So I was in the dark a lot of the time. They stopped. The thoughts stopped. And the surprise with, for me with that was not that just this blah, blah, blah stopped. It's very quiet up there, like it is now. It's very quiet. But that the fears and emotions, self-preferential ones, also fell away. And something I hadn't expected was these two. I was certain, I was very active in uh, corporate industry, I was very certain that, in fact, I had control. And I had absolute free will. And all that had happened, successes and failures, were mine my responsibility, my failure, my successes. And when I fell away, like that, snap. It just fell away right along with everything else. So I'm standing there, and I've got 1,000 people working for me, four research labs and a quarter billion dollar budget, and I've got to go to work. And there's nothing up here. <laughs> Great. Great, yeah. So I go into work expecting either to be stoned or deified, and, and neither one happens. <laughs> Nothing happens. You go through the day, and you find out that, in fact, life is even easier. It's better. It's cleaner. It's simpler. It's worked so much better than before. And I've got this thing, well, OK, if I wasn't in control, and I didn't have free will, who's running this show? And I just kept watching, and I kept seeing, in fact, life does itself just perfectly well, thank you very much. I could function actually better with this situation that I have now than I could before. Because I go into a meeting, 
big uh, meeting, and you find out that, in fact, you're the only person in the room. Nobody else was in the room all the time. They were there 10% of the time, 40% of the time, 30% of the time. You look like the smartest person in the room because you're the only one in the room that's there for the whole meeting. Uh, I've also, it's much more creative, I found. Cognition is higher. It's been that way now for 17 years, uh, except for low energy, I'm hypoglycemic, or uh, I get very tired. We can talk about why that's the case, but I think we know why it's the case. Second one is this idea of having self-referential thoughts. It's okay to keep, keep those self-referential thoughts, but it doesn't work for me. If you want to get really non-dual, you've got to realize that those are the canaries in the coal mine. You've got self-referential thoughts. A lot of people say, I'm good. You know, I had this experience 10 years ago. I'm non-dual. Yeah, there's some noise off in the corner. There's babbling and things. But I, don't, I pay no attention to the man behind the screen. And I, I just keep doing this thing. And I, I'm perfectly happy with this. In fact, you find out those are the good indicators you've got. Suzuki Roshi called these things uh, mind weeds. And he welcomed them. They give you a place to show you where so, you, some work needs to be done, where you've still got an attachment, you still got something else to do. So if you can absolutely shut them down, get no thoughts, and it's just no self-referential problematic thoughts. I work with a lot of knowledge workers. I live in a university town. They live by their thoughts. But the thoughts they live by aren't these ones about, oh, my, my project's not going to get refunded again. I'm going to have a terrible time. The department chair's going to throw me out. Not those kind of thoughts, but the ones about, oh, I need to run this project and put it in this way and organize it like this. Planning, problem solving does not change. It's easier, cleaner. Those are not emotionally charged thoughts. And amazingly, for me, amazingly, the brain can parse those out. The brain can recognize if you've got uh, thoughts, problematic thoughts, or if you've got the ones that are just planning. This coded in because it's linguistically encoded. Almost all of our, spe all of our uh, residents of our species, languages are all subject object doing of some kind, except for four languages, but not all. You can see the people. This guy, this guy you all know, I'm sure. This guy out of Maharaj. This guy you don't know. I was giving a talk in Stockholm, 2010, and he was uh, actually one of the founders of the Santo Daime Church. So, as those of you know, ayahuasca, uh, he was talking at, in Stockholm about his experiences with ayahuasca. At the end of his talk, the very last thing he said was this It's all about having no thoughts, which is a big surprise to me because it was exactly what I was after. So I saw him and said, Hey, this is fantastic. What a the correspondence that we both have exactly the same perception of why we do spiritual practice, ayahuasca or meditation. These are classical resources, Tao Te Ching, Dogen Zenji, Tanji Yoga Sutras. Yoga Sutras, 170 so sutras. You talked about Tanjali, several people in this workshop. And you find out that Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha is the second one. The first one we're going to talk about yoga. The second sutra is Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, which is yoga is the stilling of the modifications of the mind. Depending how hard you translate that, it means to stop them. This one, Bhagavad Gita, Shanaya, Shanaru, Paramat Puja, Dritti Gritaya, Atma Stam Stam Manakritpana Kinchidape Chintayat, which says gradually, gradually, grab hold of your mind and put it in the self. And don't think about anything else. So you've got a lot of these people saying pretty much the same thing. Myth three, you don't need to practice. You're already enlightened. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Zen people did this thing back in the 60s. They had to say exactly the same deal. It sells. It sells great. People come in. You tell them, hey, you're already enlightened. There's nothing you have to do. It's fantastic. Just you know, come back to the next workshop. But it turned, you find out that, in fact, absolutely not true. We've learned a lot about neuroplasticity in the last 10 years, last eight years. Enormous changes very quickly. This is a Harvard study. And two months, mindfulness meditation, 40 minutes a day, they could see five brain regions that actually changed in size in two months. That's how fast it changes. People, and I've taken many of the task personally, that tell you there's nothing you have to do, did a lot of, did a lot of practice. And Tony Parsons did years of practice. Punjaji, Papaji, did a, really a Tough, tough, long, years and years and years and years of practice. And they say, there's nothing you have to do. From where they're standing, that's true. But it's not from where you're standing. 
You've got it. You can't just walk in and pick up a violin and say, "Okay, I'm now a concert violinist." It doesn't sound very good. You've got to learn how to do it. Um, how fast it changes. Merzenich is one of the top guys in the world right now in uh, neuroplasticity, out here someplace. And he had a way to look at the monkey's uh, neural map of their face. It changed every week. Every week, how the, how the brain, central motor cortex is actually linked into these face maps. How much you practice and how you practice matters a lot. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book on 10,000 hours popularized this concept. The idea was 10,000 hours for concert violinists. A very small population, maybe 15 uh, people in, involved. And it's not as clear on concert violinists precisely what mastery means. You know, it's kind of like I know it if I see it. But the chess guys, not surprisingly, are really into this. Chess guys will metricate anything. And what they found is that, same thing, 11,000 hours to mastery. However, big bandwidth, 3,000 to 23,000. And they really know what mastery looks like in ELO points, which is how they measure success in chess. And so genetics plays a role. Genetics matters whether you're going to be a 3,000 hour person or a 23,000 hour person, but you're going to practice. And it really determines whether or not you reach this and if you can go beyond that. Some chess masters keep growing and growing and growing and growing. Some don't. Some just peek out and stop. One thing down here, and this is from Anders. I mean, it brought Anders. Anyway, he was the person who came up with all of it. He did, got to do real research that, that, uh, that they put in the 10,000-hour book. And Anders Ericsson. Anders Ericsson. Uh, practice on what you don't do well. I mean, I did a zillion hours of yoga. And if you aren't careful, you just keep doing the same exercise all over and over again. And I love to do four bends. I just do four bends all the time. You never do backward bends. If you're going to expand your yoga practice, do the parts you're not good at. Your meditation practice, do the parts you aren't doing well, that you try to avoid, because that's where your growth is going to be. Myth four, mystical experiences are a mystery. Not so much. We now have some good models for this. This fellow, Newberg, is at Penn. D'Achille was also there. He's passed on, but Newberg is still there functioning very much. Their, the their model, which is pretty much holding up somewhat, I talked to uh, uh, one of the Obi-Wans in the neuroscience yesterday, and he confirmed it's possible. The idea here being that if you can, you have two sympathetic and parasympathetic. Excitement, blah, and then calmness. Those two circuits compete with each other. They go back and forth, all, hopefully alternating. Excited, calm. Excited, calm. Excited, calm. That's what they function for. Fight and flight, relax. Two sides. What they say is if we can run these so you actually have the two of them at the same time, fully activated, they will conflict and they will shut down the inputs, the temporal and parietal lobes that do the important things for mystical experiences. You just jam the circuits, they deafferinate, you just jam the circuits and you just stop anything from going to these places that are expecting input. They almost always get input, and all of a sudden there's no input. And they, they, their postulate is that that's exactly what pushes mystical states into being. How this manifests in these input-starved mystical states, and they've got two books, well, three or four books. You can look them up any, any place. Hyperquiescence, you get very, very, very still. Hyperarousal, obviously marathon runners, voodoo, whatever, swimmers, skiers, flow. We all know about flow. God knows flow. Hyperquiescence with arousal breakthrough, you get really, really, really quiet, and then bang, something happens. You get a breakthrough and you get great bliss, exhilarating energy absorption. The converse of that here is this one. Now, I, I cheated in my meditation practice. I confess to this now after, after 30,000 hours. And how I cheated was I was a runner, and I could get into this state. I could get a runner's high. And so I thought, well, this is interesting. I started to sit, and the Zen guy said, sit still, hold your hands where they're supposed to be, and don't move. If you move, we're going to stick. We're going to come around with a stick, and we're going to hit you with a stick. And they did this very 
tough bunch of guys. So you had to really sit there. So you were, going to, you were hyperquiescent. You were not moving at all. And so if you got your mind calmed down, then you could find yourself in this hyperquiescent with the arousal breakthrough state. I found I could do that. I could sit. And after about 35 minutes, which is about a runner's high time, I got a mystical experience. I like this. Not that I, li I like it. The brain liked it. This is like a kibble for the brain. The brain said, this is the coolest game in town. I get to sit, and I get to treat at the end. Most people like go 20 minutes and stop, or 30 minutes and stop. You do the hard work, and you don't get anything. The brain says, this is no fun. I don't want to do this. So I get a kibble. My brain, we ju I just sat every time I sat, every day, until I got a kibble for the brain. And the brain really liked this, and so the brain loves to meditate. And I just, this is how my practice has been for a long, long time. I can still do it. It doesn't take 30 minutes, though. It takes up like 10 seconds. But you can just bring this on, this state here, bang, that fast. Mystical and psychotic states, uh, a lot of questions I get from many, many people about this thing. My friends say I'm crazy. Am I? Uh, my friends say I'm psychotic. Am I? And these guys, Newberg and DeKille, looked at, okay, here's, here's some examples. And I'm not trying to be a psychotherapist or psychiatrist. I'm just saying, if you've got these kind of experiences, how you talk about the experience, your break from reality, how you describe it, and how you interpret the meaning of that experience, if you put all those together, you can pretty much get an idea whether or not you're ecstatic and joyful as you talk about it, or if you're confused, terrified, and distressed after it. Similarly, if you long for return to it, or if you're just, no, I'm not going back there again. When you talk about it later, it's most mystics, empty your ego, calm, still, peaceful. Psychotics, messianic healing powers. This is not uh, proscriptive. This is not absolutely take it to the bank. If you can't function, if you can't raise your kids, if you can't do a job, if you can't go out in the world and function somehow reasonably well, then go see somebody. If not, and you fall into these categories, then it's almost certainly a mystical experience. Myth five. Spiritual path needs levels, titles, and an endpoint. Everybody loves this one. Why do they love it? We are evolutionarily bred into liking hierarchies. We became the masters and destroyers of the planet by being able to organize large bunches of ourselves to go out and do some task. And it required a hierarchical structure. Hierarchical structure benefits from levels and titles. If I say, Sam, you're enlightened. But you're only enlightened at level three. If you want to get to level four, Sam, we're going to need some money here and some more time. The workshops get longer. Uh, it'll be, you know, the usual $5,000 for two weeks is not going to be $15,000 for two weeks because it's special teaching to get to level four. <laughs> or you can take the direct path. But this is what many people do. And to believe that everybody's going to go down the same path, I think to me is beyond naive. You look, and these are, this isn't comprehensive, but if you look at the kinds of things that affect your likelihood of success in spiritual matters, it's a long list. And we all go through these things in different orders. We have different intensities of them. We have different genetics, different family, when we were born, where we were born, who our teachers were before. It's silly to believe that they're all going to go down exactly the same path at exactly the same rate. It just doesn't happen. There are lots of sayings about this, both from the Hindus and the Buddhists, that there are lots of paths up the mountain. Uh, I, my first book was very much about, look, here's 100 ways. Pick one. Pick the one that appeals to you and do it. The one you will pick and do is way better than the one you will pick and not do. So find something you love to do and then go into it and really ingest it and be with it. You can get there by many, many paths. Number six, psychedelics can produce persistent non-duality. Yeah, no. <laughs> we, have, we have one of the big ayahuasca guys in the world right there in the white the thing there. So he can throw stones if he wants to. Uh, the, the key to this thing, you've heard much about the default mode network at this conference. This is started in uh, roughly 2000, and we really fleshed it out. 
we use a, a spiritual community, a neuroscience community, and we know what this is done. This was a, uh, one of the seminal papers, Harvard, 2010, Andrews Hanna. Eleven centers basically generate this sense of selfing. All the forms and types of selfing. You've got two subnetworks in the core. One core is a potential in cortex you've probably all heard about many, many times. We're going to talk about this through here. You can see the good news, bad news is it's way down deep in the brain. It's way down inside right here and way down inside here. So the hard thing is you've got to get down in there and get a good signal. If you're going to put an EEG on the top of your head, you've got to process a lot of signals to make sure it's exactly coming from this place. And a lot of transducers. Okay, what we found out, this is Andrews Hanna now, is that one of these subnetworks creates this sense of you existing through time. You as an agent that moves from past through present quickly into future. The other one is a network that produces this sense of you and other things. You in the chair, you and the person next to you. And you find out that whether you do it with meditation, ayahuasca, mushrooms, you produce this shutdown of these two circuits. As you do, you get the classical all is one and now, now, now. They all produce this as a main core. Certainly, ayahuasca doesn't give you the same experiences as mushrooms does or meditation does, but a lot of it codes on exactly the same level, psychedelically, mystically. <clears throat> I was very heavily involved in the Yale study, um, subject, collaborator, co-conspirator, and uh, Judd Brewer at that time was at, at Yale, and same thing happened. These are teravadins, 10,000 hours plus or minus, uh, three teravadin medi uh, meditations, and looked and said, okay, what happens? Duh, the teravadins shut these things down. Not surprising, 10,000 hours. Not a, big de not a big news because in fact, as we'll see here in a second, you've got a tasking network that sits over here. Farb in 2007 proved it. You've got a tasking network that sits over here. And you've got this default mode network that's really deep down the core of the brain in here. This goes blah, 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 blah. And when you're doing a task and you're over here, then you're consumed by your task. If it's a task you love to do, you'll notice you're not thinking. If you're rock climbing, and you're doing a high pitch, you've got to be really careful. You pay attention and you don't think. And we like it because we don't think. If you're in a chess match, whatever it is, it really turns you on, avocation or vocation, this tasking network will shut down the default mode network. So these guys were really just tasking. The really interesting thing was when Judd turned off the, in, between, in between runs, he found that in fact those centers stayed shut down. Even without meditation, they were shut down for a while. We now know we've got these three circuits. This is the tasking network. This is the expanded, updated version from Andrews Hanna, 2014. And she pulled in a thousand person study from MIT to really work her thing out. And the thickness of these lines is how often they talk to each other, they operate at the same time. And you can see you've got these two sides, and you've got two centers up here, which Judd found as well, Judd Brewer found as well. And their job is to watch and control the situation. I mean, they watch to see if this thing, the, the yellow ball, is shut down. And they see if it's shut down, they can control this thing. They're right up here, it's called a salience network. These two centers are watching this and this to regulate this switching back and forth. If you've got ADHD, what it is, is this circuit, blah, 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 won't shut up. It will not let go. And so you're over here trying to get a job done, and blah, blah's over here going, and so you can't concentrate. There's a lot of good research on that, too. How shrooms work, uh, exactly the same way meditation works, not exactly. But this is IV psilocybin in the UK, uh, medium level doses. There's no way to worry about, you know, do we, am I digesting it properly or not? It's just IV. And you can get a clear picture here, infusion point, and how the, uh, this thing shuts down. As it shuts down, some of your friends may have told you, you actually get extremely intense effects. So tracks exactly on meditation. Ayahuasca, same thing. It's a well-known study now. It's only, it was recently done, but it's pretty well-known quickly. Same thing happens. These two are the core centers. Before ayahuasca, on ayahuasca, in the fMRI, they're shut down. They're gone. 
same thing happened. There's a very nice longitudinal study now we were looking at yesterday at lunch on long-term usage of ayahuasca. But they all work. The one thing, uh, and I, I recommend everybody have some kind of mystical experience. If it needs to be mushrooms, I'm not pimping for mushrooms. I'm a virgin, by the way. I'm a virgin of psychedelics. But I encourage people to, to do something. Take, take, do, get some mushrooms from somebody, anybody, any place. And <laughs> really, backyard, backyard <laughs> make, sure that you, make sure they're really good stuff. But I encourage people to do this. One fellow here in the Bay Area I work with, he's at a conference today, and uh, he'd been practicing very hard. Practice, 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 but he wasn't getting anywhere. And so I said, get some mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, magically, someone who he didn't expect would have mushrooms gave him a Hershey bar that was wrapped around, has your wrapper around some mushrooms. And he reached up, took them, lo and behold, <laughs> bango. Now the brain knew what was possible. The problem is if the brain doesn't know what's possible, it's, this is its reality. If you show it something else, you say, oh, gee, this is all kinds of things are possible. I can make this, I can make that, I can make peacocks, I can make crawling snakes, I can do all kinds of things. So you say, okay, my consensus reality is not the only reality there. The brain, as somebody said on the Friday, it's a best efforts basis. The brain's not trying to do a perfect job of replication. It's just trying to say, well, okay, the lion comes down to the stake, the lion's hungry, the lion needs the steak. That's fitness. However, the lion then says, well, okay, my belly's full. I'm looking for a lady lion. So he doesn't care about the steak anymore. Now he cares about lady lions. That's fitness. It's not perfect, but it's fitness. As your demands change, you adapt, and you move to another object. So uh, as far as matching these up, they all go on the same scale. Psychedelics, uh, what I do, persistent non-duality, just non-duality, and you can see what happens. Uh, Jeffrey Martin, who isn't here, he's, in, he's around today, uh, did his PhD thesis at CIS on this. He took 500 people, cut it down to 36 of us, and said, okay, 36 are all persistently, you spend a lot of your time within this non-dual state, this no-thought state. And so we're going we're gonna to all kinds of interviews and testing and everything else on you. We're going to see how you do. Well, Hood, of Hood Mysticism Scale, was actually on Jeffrey's doctoral committee. So this is about as good as it's going to get. And of this 36 of us in this population, nine of us scored 160. It's the highest level in the scale, and we're that way persistently, 90% of the time. So it's like a 90% of the time psychedelic experience on this scale, common scale. The problem with psychedelics is you got it six hours, and it's gone, or eight hours, or 14 hours, and it's gone. The brain doesn't get a chance to learn how to do it itself. You've got to make the brain learn how to do it itself, or it's not going to be persistent. I met a guy in Yucatan, 121212. 12. He had done 2,000 trips of high, high dose, high strength acid. I said, well, How's it going for you? He said, Not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> 2,000. He said, Well, it's not working. And actually, he developed an enormous ego around being an extreme athlete on acid. So it doesn't get you there. You've got to somehow find a way to taper it down, make the brain learn how to do it. It's exactly the same receptors. It's the same circuitry. It's the same chemicals. The brain's got them. It has to work that way, or the psychedelics wouldn't work that way. Plant medicine works because they found out how to hack our system. We discovered that we had synapses and how they worked with cannabinoids. All research results are, are reliable and good and true. Everything's fantastic, not so much. Uh, this is the big study in Journal of American Medical Association, you'll see here, on mindfulness meditation. 47 trials, lots of people. You can see the words of mindfulness meditation. However, of those 47 trials, you get down here, and the guys in the Hopkins wrote the report, said, but only 10 of those 47 trials were without bias. So you've got 37. Three-fourths of the trials, the good trials, these are the best trials, were biased. They're biased because if I'm a, an XY person of a religion, Buddhism, not Buddhism, I'm picking Buddhism. I'm like, I'm, I actually have some friends in Buddhism. Uh, if you believe that you're 
protecting the Dharma. And it's your job to protect the Dharma. And you select people from your sect, and you run your sect's practices, and you evaluate the goodness of this, the fitness of this, against your sect's attributes. That's going to be biased. No matter how careful you are, it's almost impossible to avoid bias. It doesn't have to be pernicious, but it creeps in. You've already done it with the selection of your subjects. Uh, a lot of it can't be reproduced. Psychological studies, they picked this another meta-study published in Science, just published. And 97% of the studies they picked had a very high significance, very great study, fantastic, awesome study. So they went back and tried to replicate it. Only 36% of them could they replicate. The rest of them, they could not replicate the results. So what's the value of that? Not very high. If you look down here, this is about different uh, psychotherapies. Uh, they say they're at least 25% overstated in effectiveness for the same reason. People say, oh, that's an outlier. Oh, that doesn't count. Oh, I know this person. Oh, they're crazy. Uh, so you end up then with a very carefully controlled population. So you get good statistics. So you get tenure. So you get funded. So you get more research dollars, whatever. Uh, without science, so we're screwed. I mean, it's, it's the best tool we have, the only tool we have for some of this stuff. We're not doing as well as we could. We, if we do it a lot better, it'll help us a lot more. Pardon? He was. Why? But let, let, let me finish this. I, I, I've got a couple more slides. And, and I, should, I should get five minutes, because I, I, this thing didn't get running for five minutes. Uh, myth eight was if, if there's no I, you won't be compassionate. I get this a lot. I got called non-human uh, at one, one panel discussion in, in the Netherlands. You aren't a human being because you don't have these desires and these bad things. Um, it's really compassion for most people is really reciprocal altruism. Uh, I, give, I give Sam something. I don't pick on Sam. I give Sam something. And I say, Sam, OK, yeah, let's see, I'm really helping out here. So I'm expecting something back from Sam. This goes into the hierarchical structure. You hold the structure together because I get something to Sam, and he gets to be something back later. So Sam and I are kind of looked together. We're in the same structure. We know where we are in this thing. It's the glue of the hierarchy. You can see, though, there are all kinds of things we're expecting out of this. And these guys did tons of work on this. There's even a, a, a center out here on reciprocal altruism. But it's really just let's make a deal. If you watch carefully, you can feel it in yourself. I'm helping this person down here. I'm up here. They're down there. They need this thing from me. And you give it to them and think, ah, karma points, heaven points. I'm on my way now. You're expecting reward. If not now, later. In fact, your compassion is all about you. You have to guess who said this thing. The human beings are naturally selfish. This, this guy's a really well-tuned in, scientifically trained, scientifically involved. Science shows that we are naturally compassionate, and helping someone else makes you feel good. This is scientific research. We know this. Down here, by nature, every human being loves themselves. But by helping another, you are building your own happy self. You are building your ego by doing this process of helping Sam and getting something back from Sam. It doesn't take your ego down. It actually strengthens it. Yes, you said this. Yeah. Dalai Lama. Last, non-duality is a psychotic state. <laughs> and this is a serious problem for people. Uh, DSM-5, which is the diagnostic manual by which psychologists and psychiatrists can bill Medicare or whoever, healthcare systems. And uh, they have to, it has to be in the manual. This guy from Duke actually chaired the study. He wrote a blistering, uh, almost repudiation of the study and said that, in fact, this fuzzy boundary, like for ADHD, is so broad now that many, many, many people fall into this thing and didn't before. And he also said, basically, everybody someplace will get in there. If you look, drug companies, but if you actually look, I got a blog post on this thing, take one of the big Obi-Wans in uh, depersonalization disorder, and this one woman lists off 20 characteristics of depersonalization disorder. So I took the hood mid system scale, and I listed 20 things. And they're the same 20 things. 
I mean, the mystical things line up exactly with depersonalization disorder. So you've got to somehow find a psychologist, nurse someone in the Bay Area, who understands this problem that, in fact, what we call mysticism, that we think is fantastic, uh, they've categorized, psychopathologized it. Just be aware of this. If you start hearing people, oh, you're, you're psychotic, DSM-5 says this, there's a lot of controversy about this whole thing, about DSM-5, period, but in particular about this particular issue. That's all I have, thank you.